Hey, Richard here, and in this video, I'm going to reveal the truth about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general. If you're considering putting your hard earned money into Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency, then you owe it to yourself to watch this video first. It's not all good and it's not all bad. So I'm going to give you both the pros and the cons, as well as tell you all those things that the Bitcoin people out there don't want you to hear. And I'm going to give you my opinion, an opinion coming from someone who has spent a lot of time studying billionaire investors, as well as someone that has been able to compound their own money at very high rates of return and beat the market year after year for a few years now, and doing so in a way that doesn't resemble gambling whatsoever. I guarantee there's going to be a lot of new things in here that you've never heard before and a lot of new perspectives that you haven't heard before. So I'm super excited to share this video with you. But first, please give this video a quick thumbs up right under this video because it does really help me out. So if you know absolutely nothing about Bitcoin, you probably still have heard that its price has been absolutely skyrocketing recently. This thing has been going parabolic. In fact, the total market cap for all crypto coins combined just reached one trillion dollars recently. That means hypothetically, if you were able to buy every single Bitcoin and every other crypto coin, right now at its current price levels, it would cost you $1 trillion. So that's the valuation for all the cryptocurrency out there right now. And to put that trillion dollars into perspective for you, the company Google, you're probably familiar with it, well, they have a market cap of just over $1 trillion as well. And again, that means hypothetically, if you were able to buy every single share of Google stock at the current price, it would cost you about a trillion dollars and then you'd own 100% of Google. And Google, by the way, over the past year has produced about $34 billion in profits. Now, as a side note here, I should add that Google does not pay out its profits as dividends like some companies do. Instead, it retains all of its profits and reinvests them in attempts to make more money in the future. And they've done a really good job at reinvesting their profits because they manage to at least generate 20% plus annual returns on their invested capital year after year, usually higher, and they've been doing that pretty much forever. And that's why shareholders are okay with Google not paying them a dividend because Google can reinvest that money better than they could. Nonetheless, if both Google and all of the crypto coins combined both have a market cap of $1 trillion and Google Google produces about $34 billion of profits per year. How much money do you think is produced by Bitcoin and all the other crypto coins combined? Well, the answer is actually zero. And this leads me into my first point about Bitcoin. Now, first, some watching this might be saying, wait a second, Bitcoin is supposed to be a currency or an alternative to gold. It's going to be unfair to make this comparison. And I get that. And I am going to explain what Bitcoin even is in just a minute. Let me paint a picture for you, though. Let's say that I own a bunch of Bitcoin and then I go around and I encourage everyone else to buy it. I talk about how much it's been going up and especially how much money I've made and how much money everyone else is making. And on top of that, I sound so confident and so intelligent when I give all the various reasons why I think it'll continue to go up. And let's say I use lots of fancy words and lots of lengthy explanations. So you really think that I'm just a real authority on the subject. And so then what happens is let's say my little promotion is successful and I even just get a handful of new people to go ahead and buy some Bitcoin. The act of those people buying it on average will cause the price of Bitcoin to increase, even if just slightly, because the price at any given moment is based on whatever it last traded for, if there are more buyers than sellers, then the price will gravitate higher based on supply and demand. So my little promotion has been successful. Something that I own has gone up in price. And if I wanted to sell, I could make a little profit. And as a side benefit here, not only has my little promotion been profitable, but also I've essentially recruited a handful of new promoters as well. These new Bitcoin owners that I've inducted are equally incentivized to go on and continue to promote it and also defend it against anyone who speaks poorly of it. Because me and my Bitcoin crew don't want people to start selling, so anyone who says something bad about it, we're gonna jump in there and defend it. On that note, Bitcoin and these other crypto coins can seriously crash when everyone starts rushing for the exit door all at once. In 2015, it dropped by 84%, and in 2018, it dropped by 81%. Having said that, I won't pretend that it hasn't came back each time it's crashed. Each time it's came back higher and higher than ever. Let's actually take this little thought experiment one little step further. Let's say that the handful of people that I recruited, let's say that each of them through their own promotion recruit another handful of people. And then let's say that those handfuls of people recruit another handful of people each who recruit another handful of people each and on and on like this. That's interesting because guess what? At the heart of it all, that's exactly why we've been seeing the price of Bitcoin just absolutely exploding recently. Now, I'm not saying it's a pyramid scheme or a Ponzi scheme or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. Sure, it has its similarities, but what I am saying is simply that it's very much in the self-interest of the buyers and owners of Bitcoin and other crypto coins to speak very highly of it and encourage more people to buy it. Whereas the people that may have something negative to say are not so incentivized to be so vocal about those opinions. I mean, 
mean, unless they're trying to make a bunch of new haters and new enemies, why bother saying anything? So besides the odd person here and there, the Bitcoin detractors are mostly staying silent and kind of just watching in amusement. And if they speak up, like on social media, they get pretty quickly attacked by the army of Bitcoin defenders. So what ends up happening here is that for the new beginner investor, the person who woke up this morning and thought, you know what, I need to start planning for my future and my retirement. I don't really know where to start, but I know I need to start learning about investing. So I'm going to go on the internet and I'm going to start learning. Well, they inevitably stumble upon all the very positive information about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general. And at the same time, they find very little negative information about it all. It'd be easy for them to just assume that it's the greatest thing ever. So if you're a brand new investor, I got your back. However, believe it or not, from here on out, it's not gonna be a complete bash fest on Bitcoin and crypto. You might be surprised by what I have to say. Someone I admire greatly says, I never allow myself to hold an opinion on anything I don't know the other side's argument better than they do. So I set out to understand both sides of the argument thoroughly. And before we dive in deep, I wanna take a step back and I wanna explain something that I believe is actually gonna be more important than anything else you're gonna hear in this video. So humans have this thing where in the interest of conserving time and energy, something that's common among all life forms, humans specifically have the ability to tap into something called groupthink. And groupthink is mostly a good thing. Groupthink is what allows us to learn and acquire knowledge without having to experience every single thing firsthand. Right, because what would happen if we had to learn every single thing firsthand? Well, we probably wouldn't last very long for one thing, we'd end up walking off the side of a cliff. But the other thing is it would just take so much time. So while it's mostly a good thing because it saves us time and energy, it can also be a bad thing because it can cause us to not think for ourselves sometimes and sometimes it can lead you down the wrong path. Example, have you ever been driving and you were not quite sure which direction to go, but you were pretty sure was supposed to be a right turn. And then most of the people in the car also confirm for you, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a right turn here. But then somebody else in the car is very confidently like, no, 100%, it's a left turn. And so you take the left turn because you assume that they're correct, but then it turns out they were wrong. It was supposed to be a right turn. Why do we take that person's directions when we knew for ourselves that we were pretty sure it was a right turn and everyone else in the car agreed it was probably a right turn? Well, in effort to conserve time and energy, we've developed an unconscious tendency to just assume that whoever sounds the most sure of themselves and the most confident is probably the person that has the correct information. So that's one way our human programming, you could call it, can hinder us. It can send us down the wrong path, following the advice of the person who sounds the most sure of themselves, even if their information is absolute nonsense. And another way we get tripped up by this human programming of ours is that if we see a lot of people are agreeing on something and that they're all saying the same thing, we have this tendency to be mentally lazy and just assume that since all of these people are agreeing on it, it must be correct and not actually expending the time and energy it takes to think it through for ourselves. Crazy example of this, they did a social experiment to see what people would do when they knew they were right, but the rest of the group was disagreeing with them. In this experiment, people were shown a line and then asked to select the line of the same length from a group of three lines. But what they did is they placed a bunch of other people in the group that were part of the experiment to intentionally give the wrong answer. And what they found was that people would actually conform to the group and give the wrong answer as well because everyone else was. Even if they could very clearly see which line was the one of matching length. So what I'm saying here is that humans do have natural tendencies to one, conform to the group and two, follow whoever sounds the most confident and the most sure of themselves. Ultimately here, it's just good to be aware of these human tendencies because when you get sucked into groupthink, it can sometimes really send you down the wrong path. To be a successful investor, we need to exercise and strengthen the mental muscle of thinking for ourselves. It's probably the most important quality that you need to be successful at investing. And the bonus benefit from exercising this mental muscle and staying sharp is that, well, I believe that it will help you to live a very long life. After all, Charlie Munger just turned 97 years old and Warren Buffett is up there too at 90. And it's incredible how sharp these guys still are. Yes, it's important to learn from the experts. However, when you're listening to them, listen and make decisions based on the facts and not based on how sure of themselves they sound. Okay, so now that I've given you these new things to consider, I'm going to tell you the first most important thing you should know about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So here's the obvious reason not to buy Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency and just stay away from it altogether, which is simply because it's a non-productive asset and therefore does not have any intrinsic value. A productive asset is something like a rental property, a business, or a farm. These are assets that at the end of the day, they produce income. Listen, if you were going to buy a farm as an investment, you could roughly figure out how much you'd be willing to pay for it based on how how much income it could produce for you in the future. This is what is meant by intrinsic value. So that's a key point actually. The intrinsic value of a productive asset is based on the income it can produce for you in the future. On the other hand, non-productive assets by their definition can only be speculative investments because non-productive assets are only worth what somebody else is willing to pay for them. If you're buying a non-productive asset, you can't do a similar calculation like you could if you were buying a farm or another productive asset to determine what would be a sensible price to pay. So this means if you're 
buying a non-productive asset like Bitcoin, you're simply counting on there continuing to be more people in the future to buy it off you for a higher price than you've paid. That's the only way to make money from a non-productive asset, to sell it to somebody else. A productive asset, on the other hand, could put money in your pocket for the rest of your life without ever needing to sell it. So this begs the question about Bitcoin. And by the way, if you're watching this and you still have no clue what Bitcoin is, hang in with me. I am going to explain in just a second. Nonetheless, as I was saying, it begs the question about Bitcoin. Why would somebody be willing to buy your Bitcoin or any of the cryptocurrency from you in the future for a higher price than you've paid? Well, the answer is because they themselves are hoping for and counting on the same thing as you for someone else to be there in the future to buy it off them for even a higher price. And I don't know about you, but to me, this whole thing sounds pretty fragile. And with all that said, if you decided you didn't want anything to do with Bitcoin, just based on the fact of it being a non-productive asset, I wouldn't blame you. But now let's talk about the other side of the argument. Okay, so the US dollar is the world's global reserve currency. Once upon a time, US dollars were backed by gold. But once the gold standard was removed, US dollars became known as what's called a fiat currency. A fiat currency is a currency that's not backed by a commodity such as gold. It becomes just paper or numbers on a screen and it's very easy to create and print more of it. Historically, fiat currencies do get printed constantly. And as more money is printed, the value of your money in your pocket decreases. Do you remember the five cent hamburger? No, neither do I. That was before my time. But it's a really easy way to understand inflation. The price of hamburgers didn't necessarily actually increase. It was the value of the money that decreased. And businesses out there just raised their prices on the goods and services that they sell just to keep up with inflation. Some inflation is actually a good thing because it helps to stimulate the economy. And the Federal Reserve Bank claims that they aim for 2% inflation per year. But the amount of money that's been getting printed in recent years and even in recent months has been completely insane. This is a little screenshot here from another video I did recently all about inflation. And it shows how much US dollars are circulating within the United States system per individual in America for the last 50 years. And so we can clearly see how much the money supply has been increasing. Some of the Bitcoin and crypto enthusiasts out there are estimating that true inflation will be more like 10 to 15% per year over the next decade or so. And to be honest, I can see how this could possibly happen, at least for some goods and assets like houses. Maybe not that high, but definitely higher than 2% per year. Just as true as it is that fiat currencies tend to get constantly printed, it's also true that historically, fiat currencies have had a tendency to eventually fail due to hyperinflation. Someone pointed out here that Bitcoin has already reached 40% of the life expectancy of the average fiat currency. Now I did not fact check that one, so you're gonna have to verify it for yourself, but I'm trying to paint Bitcoin in a positive light here. So let's look at what the imagey link says. It says, according to a study of 775 fiat currencies by dollardays.org, there is no historical precedence for a fiat currency that has succeeded in holding its value. 20% failed through hyperinflation, 21% were destroyed by war, 12% were destroyed by independence, 24% were monetarily reformed, and 23% are still in circulation approaching one of the other outcomes. The average life expectancy for a fiat currency is 27 years old, with the shortest lifespan being one month. Founded in 1694, the British pound sterling is the oldest fiat currency in existence. At a ripe old age of 317 years, it must be considered a highly successful fiat currency. However, success is relative. The British pound was defined as 12 ounces of silver, so it's worth less than 1 200th or 0.5% of its original value. In other words, the most successful long-standing currency in existence has lost 99.5% of its value. So use this information however you'd like. But nonetheless, this is really what's at the heart of what the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency people are counting on. They would tell you that eventually the global monetary system as we know it will fail and that one of the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, for example, will become the new global currency. Kind of like a Star Wars galactic credit. So sure, I know many of the buyers of Bitcoin right now are simply just buying because the price has been going up so far and they don't want to miss out. Also known as FOMO buying. And they're not really thinking that deeply about it. But other buyers are essentially making the bet that the financial system as we know it will sort of collapse and in its ruin, Bitcoin will be adopted as the new global currency. And if that happens, they'll instantly be filthy rich because they saw it coming before everyone else. Sure, it could totally happen one day and someone could make a very strong argument as to why it's inevitable. And there is some validity to this thinking. So let me explain the logic behind it. Both gold and Bitcoin have a fundamentally limited supply and therefore cannot be printed and so are immune to high inflation or hyperinflation. Let me give you some background. Bitcoin was invented by an anonymous individual that goes by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. And that's pretty much all we know about him or her besides the fact that they created this pretty amazing feat of computer science 
back in 2009. Bitcoin was designed to essentially be a digital gold. Much like how gold is fundamentally limited based on the geology of the earth, Bitcoin's programming limits it to 21 million coins in total. And at the time of filming this, there have been about 18.5 million of those Bitcoins mined so far. However, because the computing power required to mine the coins becomes increasingly difficult, they're estimating that the last Bitcoin will be mined in the year 2140, on May 7th to be exact. By the way, the creator, Satoshi Nakamoto, has 1.1 million of those Bitcoins, which makes him or her the largest holder of those 1.1 million coins, which have a market value of $45 billion right now at current prices. So that's the person at the top of the pyramid. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But it should technically have him ranked among the top 20 wealthiest people in the world. Although this anonymous person created it, there's no single authority over Bitcoin. It's completely decentralized. The design is such that no one can control it or manipulate it, including the founder. Now, while I'll fully admit that I don't understand all the intricate details of blockchain technology, my understanding is that the encryption and security and accuracy is enforced by multiple parties on the Bitcoin network that do complex calculations to verify the transactions. The incentive for running these computers that are doing these calculations and maintaining the protocol is earning freshly mined Bitcoins. In the very beginning, anyone with a decent computer could mine Bitcoins. But these days it requires serious computing power and therefore there have been major operations set up all over the world to mine the Bitcoins. It's no joke, people are going after those things like it's the next gold rush. And essentially that's what it is, a digital gold. My friend Floris, who's an investor like myself, nonetheless pointed out to me for argument's sake that every single civilization in history has independently started using gold as their currency. When the Europeans came to America, they immediately started fighting with the Mayans over the gold. Both cultures already independently considered gold to be of value. Gold doesn't rust, it lasts forever, it doesn't take up a lot of space, and it's very rare. It's a great store of value, and it's been a store of value for thousands of years. If you dig up ancient cities, you'll find little gold and silver coins. Arguably, however, Bitcoin is an even better version of gold because the mining process for Bitcoin is limited in a very clearly and defined and guaranteed way, whereas the supply of gold is limited but in a much less defined and exact way. Okay, so if Bitcoin is a better alternative to gold, let's explore that. Let's just see how gold has done historically as an investment. Here's how gold did compared to stocks as an investment. The black line here represents the Wilshire Large Cap Index, which is similar to the more popularly known S&P 500 index, but the Wilshire Index is 750 companies instead of 500, and it's what's called a total return index, so it accounts for all the dividends being reinvested back into the fund, which means that it gives a very good and accurate way to compare the average performance of stocks in general compared to gold over time. And the price of gold is represented here by this gold colored line. The farther back you go, the more impactful the compounding effects of dividends becomes. In any one or two or three year period, a non-productive asset like gold or Bitcoin or even Pokemon cards can easily outperform productive assets like stocks. However, over long periods of time, productive assets like stocks will always win simply because of the fact that productive assets produce cash which can be reinvested, which gives you the ability to tap into the powerful effect of compounding growth. And compounding growth is the most powerful force in the world. And quickly, I'll add in here for the beginners watching this because is an important fundamental to know. When you own shares of stock, it means you own an interest in a business. You own part of that business when you own shares of its stock. Nonetheless, that's the other big problem with non-productive assets. Besides the fact that there's no way of calculating for yourself what it's worth and its value is just based on what somebody else is willing to buy it off you for, the other major limitation is that you can't tap into that powerful effect of compounding when you invest in a non-productive asset. So honestly, here's what I'll say. If you want to buy a little bit of Bitcoin as a just in case the world collapses and Bitcoin becomes the big solution, lottery ticket, go ahead and do it. I wouldn't fault you for it. This little narrative is actually believable and it's possible. It can totally happen. But if your goal is to build wealth and if you're using Bitcoin or any other non-productive asset, then you're doing it all wrong. Or if you're going to spend your days trading in and out of Bitcoin to make a little bits of profit here and there, in my opinion, that's a massive waste of time. And in my personal opinion, even spending all the hours it would take to really truly understand blockchain technology and all the extra little details like hot wallets versus cold wallets and what it means when a cryptocurrency is forked. I hate to say it, but I think the whole thing is just a massive waste of time. If your goal is to build wealth, you'd be much better off spending that time learning the art of valuing productive assets like businesses. Because if you know how to value a business, then you'll have the ability to know for yourself whether an investment is a bargain at a particular price or if it's too expensive. And that's a pretty cool superpower to have. Speaking for myself, I don't own any Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency and I'm not planning on buying any either. Perhaps when I'm 
super wealthy one day, I might change my mind and I might decide to buy just a little bit of Bitcoin in case the world does collapse and Bitcoin does become the one currency. And maybe I'll even buy a little bit of gold as my just in case there's a zombie apocalypse fund as well, put in the vault. Ultimately though, the way I see it is that even if Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency does become the new one and only global currency, if that prophecy does turn out to be true, well, the businesses that I own through owning shares of stock will just continue making their money, but instead transacting in this new currency and everything will be business as usual for me. It's not like my ownership in the various great companies that I own will just disappear. So for now, I'm just gonna continue to buy stocks of great companies at good prices and let my money continue to compound. Yes, I do recognize that high inflation right now is a real thing, especially right now. And my solution is to just buy businesses that perform well in high inflation environments. Businesses with strong pricing power, which means they have the ability to increase prices without losing market share to competitors, those are the great businesses that I'm looking for. While I was writing the script for this video, I made a couple posts in a couple Facebook groups that I knew included individuals that were pretty knowledgeable when it came to Bitcoin. I asked, what are the positives besides just the fact that it's been going up and that it might be adopted as a global currency one day? Is there anything else positive about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general that I'm missing here? Any post Posts about Bitcoin gets a lot of attention these days, especially right now. So here's a couple honorable mentions that came up. And although there were a lot of people chiming in with very lengthy explanations of why it was so great, ultimately though, when you boil it all away, all they were really doing is giving reasons why they think other people will continue to buy it, why they think banks will start to buy it, and pension fund administrators will start to buy it, and hedge fund managers will start to buy it, and mentioning all the bigger buyers that already have been buying it, because there have been a bunch. But besides telling me who is buying and who might be buying soon, in spite of the very lengthy explanations, the summary was the same. It's an alternative to gold and because money is being devalued at such a high rate, they were just certain that eventually masses of people will start adopting it and it will just take over. I also discovered that there's another group of people that also love cryptocurrency and they think it's the future, but they don't like Bitcoin. These people instead have another crypto coin that they think will reign supreme. So they believe that one of the crypto coins will become the one and only global currency one day, but they just don't think it will be Bitcoin. One curious point on that note is the question, what happens when all the Bitcoins have been mined and there's no longer an incentive to run the calculations that verify the transactions? Does it become worthless? It's interesting and I don't know the answer. It probably is one of the questions that does need answering before you go ahead and buy it though, because if that is true and people start realizing, wait a second, one day this will be worthless, that kind of means it's worthless now. It kind of means it's worthless now. Again, that's beyond my knowledge, just a little interesting point that I found. I'm sure plenty of people will be willing to tell you whatever you wanna hear on this subject. Another comment that I saw coming in was people saying that Bitcoin could be a productive asset because there's now companies like BlockFi that are willing to pay you 6% interest when you deposit your Bitcoin with them. However, they're wrong about this. In order for someone to pay you 6% annual returns, they would need to take that money that you've deposited with them and they would need to earn at least greater than 6%. This company particularly is earning its money by lending it out at higher rates. So they're essentially acting like a bank, taking deposits from you, paying one rate, and lending it out at a higher rate. However, they're making big promises here. It's hard to promise 6%, and it'll be interesting to watch to see how this one unfolds. Unlike an actual bank, BlockFi has no FDIC or SIPC insurance protecting you from losing all your money. The fact that you could lend your Bitcoin out, whether it's to another company acting like a bank or just lending it out to a friend with a set interest rate, does not make it a productive asset. Now here's my final thoughts. After everything I've said here, I'll admit that when it comes to the subject of cryptocurrency and blockchain and everything else, I'm not as knowledgeable as some people who have dedicated years to studying this stuff. And I never will be. However, it's my opinion that expending the mental energy required to think about all the hypothetical futures of the various crypto coins is a massive waste of time. If you're new here and you've resonated with what I've had to say, I make videos about investing and I would encourage you to check out some of the other videos I've made. Please remember, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just someone who loves investing. So don't take any of my content as financial advice. It's not advice. If you would feel more comfortable speaking with a qualified professional in your area, you should definitely do that. If you want to keep learning about investing the way I think about it and the way the billionaires of this world that I've studied think about it, then check out this playlist that I've made. I put it in a particular order that I think will take you from beginner to having a very strong base of the fundamentals of investing. 